Blake Murphy is here. Looks good. Thanks, man. You're a TV guy now. Do you think you're more of a TV guy now than a podcast guy? No. Think you're more of a TV guy than a writer? Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. I miss, wow. I miss writing, but yeah. I, I missed writing until on Saturday, Grange and Gary uh, Mello asked me last minute, hey, could you write off this Raptors Wizards game? Uh, Grange isn't doing it and, and we have no one available. And I was like, I don't, I do miss writing. I don't miss writing about Raptors Wizards at the end of the tankathon season yeah. for both teams. So sometimes I'm envious of shows and writers who get to focus on one sport because it's it's just a way more manageable workload in terms of how much you need to pay attention to, right? Like I pay attention to the four major sports and then other stories surrounding them, right? But this is the time where I go, I'm good. Is a Raptors season like this one where, yeah, I didn't watch Raptors Wizards. I, I saw that on the schedule and I went, I don't need to do this to myself. I went to Raptors Thunder, which I, it was, I, I just wanted to see Shea, but it was so bad, Blake, that I couldn't even enjoy the game. I couldn't even enjoy Shea. I couldn't enjoy the Thunder. And that's because, a game where, like, relative to the standard the Raptors yeah. have been playing to, you they got you got yeah, three, yeah. like, spirited quarters out that's of them. That's what I'm saying. But you can't do it because there's no stakes. There's no stakes to any of the games, and it's kind of painful. There was a moment where I was cheering for the non-tank, right? Hey, get out of this lottery. And uh, I'm already saying I was right. Before they take their pick, anybody who's followed March Madness this year and saw the two Kentucky guards who, if they stand on each other's shoulders, are an NBA player. They're as tall as our new guy, Mike Jose. If they stand on each other's shoulders, the two guards of Kentucky are six foot five. And Cody Williams, who to me looks like he weighs maybe 138 pounds at six foot 10 uh, and can play 10 minutes in the elimination game for the Colorado Buffaloes. It's not, it's not great. Those are the top guys in this draft. So I was cheering for that, but even that is gone. Even that is gone. And you know, I, I was actually thinking of, I'm trying to do a segment and put together a segment. And I was thinking about it yesterday. I was talking about this with Ben, like a Simpsons monkey paw. Mm. Remember that where it's like, you make yeah. a wish, but the wish becomes the worst reality or there's always a catch with the reality. Yeah. And to me, the Raptors have a monkey paw scenario, which is the Raptors will pick a direction, mm -hmm. but it ends up being in the most unwatchable Raptors basketball in decades. This is even worse than the Florida, the Tampa season, uh, the blue Jays monkey paw. This is the way to kind of pivot into them. All the fans ever wished for was meaningful September <laughs> baseball. But that's actually all you get is it's meaningful, those series against the Rangers, but you lose all the games. It's meaningful, those playoff games that you've gotten, but you're never going to win any of them. So congrats. You have Simpsons monkey pod your way into this Toronto Blue Jays team. All right, let's maybe we'll come back to to the Raptors. But as let's, of right now, I want to talk. Jays, I want to yeah. talk Jays with you. So uh, as a good beat writer uh, or like a good beat writer. I'm trying to come up with different angles for different guests on the Blue Jays all week long, right? And with you, you're my math guy, okay? Mm. You're Mr. Numbers. Today, I want Mr. Numbers to explain to me, buy or sell, essentially, positive, negative, or just reasonably the same, right? When it comes to regression. Because that is one of the biggest stories of this Blue Jays season is who is going to have positive regression? And we've basically built this as, well, Vladdy, we've already seen his floor. He's got to go up. Well, Varsho, he, we've already seen his floor. where He's got to go up. Well, Bo had an actually down season by his standards. Springer had a down season by his standards. You go across the board and basically the Blue Jays couldn't find four players that actually produced for them above what their expectations were, right? It was Kevin Kiermeyer, Babe Schneider, and Brandon da Belt. Danny Jansen and Brandon Belt. Like Belt was their third best yeah. hitter from, I think, May 1st on. Yeah, he's not on the team anymore. They decided, hey, guess what? Because he's 100 years yeah, old. For sure. But they also replaced him with a guy who's actually older than him. So, yes. yeah, uh, they have, they employ the two oldest players in baseball right now, which is, uh, which is really fun. That's interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah. I, well, I that's mean, a good one, stat once, to start with. once Votto's on the team, yeah. Justin Turner and Votto are, I believe, the two oldest players. I actually baseball. just learned that uh, the reason why we put commas between three digits or dashes between numbers is because our brains can only process so many numbers at once. Right. Usually the max for people is seven. 
Okay, so seven numbers in a row. That's why it was such a big deal when we moved to including the area code and phone numbers. Yeah. When yeah. when I first started, when I, I had 6227207 yeah. locked in there. For so, <laughs> and then I'm like, oh, I got to do 519-622-7207. Even though yeah. every number starts with 519, yeah. it's way tougher it's to harder. lock that in. Yeah. And then phones came on and none of us will, like, my mom's number is the only number that I know. Yeah. Um, I, but I, even, I used to have that. I, I think it would be tough for me to even get that one now. I yeah. gotta, I gotta, I gotta dig deep for my mom's number. I won't say that. I won't say it out loud. Yeah, but yeah. <laughs> I was, I almost said it to prove it, and yeah. then. Oh, the, I thought you meant mine. No, like, uh, I thought no. that was a good mom joke. Where no. you were like, I, I could say your mom's number. Yeah, that, that would have been, been a good yeah, one. No, I almost said my mom's out to like prove that I remember it, and then yeah, Denise would have been getting yeah. some texts. Yeah, that's probably true. Um, so you. essentially, where I'm going with that is, I'm going to try to limit the numbers because I think yep. there's only so many things that people can actually process. But I want to do positive regression, negative regression, or mostly ends up staying the same. So cool. let's start with the number one guy, which is Vladimir Guerrero Jr., right? Because I, I think a lot of it has been, if you're looking at the mantra from spring that I talked with Arden Zwelling about and that Barker did a great job outlining on Blair and Barker the other day, it's do damage on what you can do damage on, okay? So they're trying to be more selective. They're trying to be more patient at the plate. But that wasn't the entire thing with Vladdy last year. He was barreling baseballs. He was putting balls in the air. And a lot of the numbers actually indicated that he was supposed to be having a much better season than the one that he had, especially when it comes to the home runs and the extra base hits. So when you're looking at this year, where do you think Vladdy fits in this picture from positive negative regression? Is, I'll actually frame it this way, because I think it'd be hard to say negative regression for him. How big of a positive regression are you actually looking at with him? And that's that's the biggest question. So I, I'm reasonably optimistic Vlad yeah. is going to bounce back. But the big warning flag, first of all, when it comes to Vlad's actual output versus expectations, I think that, or sorry, his, yeah, his actual output versus like the analytic, what we expected kind of stats. I think Vlad is, is having an interesting career in two important ways. And okay. one is a reminder that, even over the course of a whole season, those things don't even out, right? Like if you, if you're at the leaderboard at the start of the season in expected, the the gap in your actual slugging versus expected slugging, there's nothing that says that's got to catch up by the end of the year. In fact, you know that, and I've talked about this before on Jay's talk plus is like part of why I like looking at the numbers and the expected stuff is the like secret sauce, the black box between this happened. And this is what we expected to happen is like, it, that's the like magic part, right? That's like sports that's, is, that's what's fun. Exactly. That's what we're trying to figure out. That's what teams are trying to figure out. So I think it's really interesting in that sense. The other is that I don't know how close we are to getting this data, but they're the best theory I've heard for why some guys sustain gaps between actual and expected has to do with the spin that gets put on a ball off the bat. Mm. So a big part of Jose Batista's breakout was the ability to change how he was hitting the ball in terms of the spin and how that carries. Any golfer can tell you, um, you know, what, what that feels like or what that look, how you add yards to your drive by adding that extra little spin and, and the way it slices through the air, right? Right. Um, now we don't have that yet. I've heard some good theories on, Hey, there's too much backspin on the way it comes off the bat. I don't know how to fix that. Jose Batista famously fixed it, but I do think at some point in the next couple of years, that's something we'll have numbers on and be able to maybe figure out why Vlad could hit the ball so hard and it doesn't leave the park. Mm -hmm. Um, sometimes now to your actual question, I am reasonably optimistic. The reason for pessimism is basically this. So these projection systems, they don't just spit out a number. They spit out a, what would happen in the worst case scenario? What would happen in the best case scenario? What would happen in the medium, like the average scenario? Mm -hmm. And then we use the average scenario. If you go on someone's fan graphs page and you see their projection line or whatever, that's the 50th percentile. That's like the medium outcome. What worries me is that if you look at the high, high, high end of the outcomes, these systems are no longer optimistic that Vlad can even get back to 2021 level. So that's only two years ago. And even with the cold, not cold second half, but he, he cooled off after the hot start. He had a 166 WRC plus. So about 66% better than league average at the plate. The 90th percentile for Pakoda right now, Pakoda is baseball prospectuses, uh, projection system. Uh, they have them at 155, yeah. which is really, really good. Yep. That is like, you are on some MVP ballots. You're a top 10 hitter in baseball, but even in the 90th percentile, almost everything has gone right. Projection. Vlad is not as good as 2021. He was 167 OPS plus that year. Yeah. 
So this is saying it's 150. a marketable difference. Yeah, we're we're saying one fifty. Yeah. That's going from the best hitter in baseball yeah. to like a eight to twelve range best hitter yeah. in baseball. Still awesome for yeah. your baseball team, but, but it's not a, MVP. It's a little concerning that these systems, even though that's only two years ago, look at it and say he's not getting back to that level. You know what though? I don't know how many people. Maybe there's still some people left over that need it that way. I think that if you're looking at it from a marketing standpoint. You need to have it that way because yeah. every team wants to have a, a player that you could say is one of the best at their sport. But to me, that's more become, if you were asking to, to me anyways, uh, the average Blue Jays fan, who needs to be the MVP this year? I think most would answer Bo now. Yeah. I mean, Bo, like because he plays a premium position and has improved to like average at that position defensively, like yeah. he's got the clearest path to posting like a six win season or whatever mm-hmm. that gets you in the MVP discussion. Vlad is just like, because you play first base and even if you're good at first base defensively, it's not valuable. Like you have to be the best hitter in baseball to get in that conversation. Um, It's why last year was so frustrating where like, yeah, he was an above average hitter, but he's like 35th among first basemen. I was going to say he wasn't, he wasn't even an above average first baseman. Um, So in terms of the optimism, the the baseline projection says Vlad will be even better than 2022, at least like in a normal scenario, he's bouncing back to like a Mm. 135 OPS plus. That's not game changing. I was going to say that's barely better than that year, but it would be, but but we're talking about your baseline. You're not, you're not factoring in, Hey, he came into camp trimmer and Mm -hmm. in better shape. You're not factoring in, Hey, maybe the knee and and wrist stuff from last year is gone. You're not factoring Mm -hmm. in any of that. You're not factoring in how good his spring has been at the plate. And you're still saying, well, yeah, he's going to be better than the last two years. Mm -hmm. So I think that speaks to just how big the talent level is is here and how much had to go wrong last year. Um, The thing I'm most curious about is like on the way up and I know he's only hit 300 one year, but Mm -hmm. the hit tool was supposed to be so good Mm -hmm. that even when the power slumped, this was a guy who would still hit like 280 and that, you know, obviously Vlad hitting 280 and slugging like 350 for a month isn't great, Mm -hmm. but there's that floor established, right? Of like, even when he's slumping, he's contributing. And last year, we didn't see that at all. Like he hit 260 last Mm -hmm. year, 260, 265 last year. Um, And that's not there. So that's, I'm curious if that comes back, if we see some more of that, you know, the bat to ball part of his his profile. Um, But obviously people mostly just care. We, we're going to get back to, you know, 35, 40 dingers. So does the guy, that's kind of it for me is, when you say he's the baseline is supposed to be better than 2022, I go, yeah, his OPS was 818. Yeah. That's not like, like, would you, would you be happy if he got that into the 850, 875 range in the, like keeping in mind that league I'd average was 715 last year, yeah, I'd be happy. But I think for this to be what I would call a resounding success season mm-hmm. for Vlad, the OPS has to start with a nine. Okay. That that's going to be to me, if, if you're, because part of the conversation with him is, is he going to be one of the pillars of your franchise? And I don't think he's a pillar as a first baseman with an OPS that starts with an eight. No, I mean, you're certainly, certainly not to the extent of, you know, the contracts that we were kicking around that, but that's uh, what a I year mean. ago. That's what I mean is you, you're talking in right now, this is a make or break season for the Bo Vladdy, you two guys at the center of this core, you two guys being built around to me, Bo is basically a near guarantee. Yeah. I, I wish that the Blue Jays would have already negotiated a contract with him. I know some people are dubious in terms of how he's going to age out, especially defensively. I mean, yeah, if he has to move the second base yeah, or left field whatever. or something like I, that. I just think but that that's a, a couple years away. I'm willing to gamble on a guy that is consistent with the bat every single season, who's always going to be a hits leader and also has the best work ethic on the team. Mm-hmm. Like those are just, that, that just, I'm fine with that. Uh, if you don't end up with surplus value on the contract. Okay. So be it Sur- surplus value is for yeah. guys on the way up. Yeah, like no, it. no free agent contract yeah. or next contract, or I shouldn't say no, but it's very, very rare for any of those to be like yeah. surplus value in terms of like dollars per win and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. It's like, this was the whole plan is like, while Vlad and Bo and to a lesser extent, Manoa and Kirk and those guys are inexpensive, they're controllable. They're in arbitration or whatever. That's when you go out and spend on veteran free agents. And mm-hmm. like, yeah, Springer's not returning surplus value, but he's a vet who you mm-hmm. can put in and is worth, you know, w- 
was for the first couple of years. We'll see. Of, that's next. Yeah, was <laughs> for the first couple of years worth the contract. Yeah. You know, you get all these pitchers, and they've done really well hitting on these pitcher contracts. Yeah. But like when you pay a pitcher twenty five million a year, or twenty million a year, no, you're not getting it, surplus. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, and, and that's that's okay. Once mm-hmm. guys get to that point, the challenge for the front office is if you're going to pay guys what they're worth, mm-hmm. eventually you got to have the next wave of inexpensive guys, and that's kind of as the Jays enter this season where everything should feel really, really urgent because Bo and Vlad only have two years left and the veteran free agents they have are, you know, a year further into their contract, a year further into their thirties is the farm system's the weakest in the AL East. Mm-hmm. Like you can like some of their prospects, one of the weakest but, in all but baseball. there's not that wave. Um, yeah. You talked to Jeff Ponce recently mm-hmm. about, and look, there's some nice stuff happening with the teens down at the complex from it, from what it sounds like. Sure. But that's, that's far down the line. Like Arjun Namala is not, helping this team during the Bo Vlad, maybe at the tail end of a Bo Vlad mm-hmm. window, but not anytime soon. So um, that's the, that's the concern. You, you're not concerned with, Hey, Bo is going to now going to get paid what he's worth. Mm-hmm. It's if we pay Bo what he's worth, uh, where do we find the talent to surround him? That's not a Bo Bichette issue. That's a front office issue. Okay. So then I'm going to get in th- Then let's knock off the three guys that cool. I think represent the potential for surplus value. Because then I'm going to get into the negative, the, neg- the positive or the potential negatives okay. or how bad the regression is going to be. But let's go to the three guys. Cause I, I don't even think it's worth really doing Bo. I think he had no. a down season, but ultimately it is what it is with Bo Bichette, right? Like yeah. we, we don't need to go over and, this. And like the down season was like so much of that was tied up in like, well, he yeah. got hurt a couple times. He probably rushed back from everything. Mm-hmm. It seemed like, and like he started the season so well that it felt like, He's also got this consistency thing going where he's basically been the same no, guy OPS yeah. wise. And and when it comes to, Hey, he's going to change his approach, dude. He's the dead last guy that I'm yeah. picking in terms of, yeah, that's actually the, the only happen. thing I want from Bo this year yeah. in terms of like, Hey, like I would like to see you do something different or do something more. Um, in 2021, he went 25 for 26 stealing bases. Yeah. He's, he attempted eight steals last year. Yeah. I would like to see him get back to a little bit of it that. It was weird because one of the big stories at a Jays camp last year was, hey, the bases are bigger and everybody's going to steal. And then, yeah. And then the Jays were they, bottom 10 and stolen base attempts. Yeah. And they kept, they said, like, Whit Merrifield's going to steal. And they were like, no, he's old now. He's yeah. not doing that. Is, are you going to use the steal pivot to one of the guys here? No, actually, I'm just going to ah. keep with the, uh, so I've got three guys and you can tell me if you're going to add anybody okay. to this list that are the highest candidates for surplus value, right? Okay. So let's start with Dalton Varsho because a big part of that trade was the contract. Hey, you've got a controllable guy who we actually think has a lot of upside. And it turned out last year anyways, that not only did the upside not materialize, he showed a brand new version of his downside offensively. And I know most of it happened at home. It was a very weird season. I do think that there was a big mental component to this. Absolutely. But I, I think that that, is, you know, you talk to people around the team and stuff yeah. too, like the last couple of weeks. And it seems like, the weight and Barrios dealt with this too, right? Yeah. Of like, you got the contract, you got the ball early and, and not a opening day, but too. yeah. Well, he got the ball two years ago on opening day. Mm-hmm. He got a 2020. Yeah. So like you get that, you get the contract, you get the pressure. And in Varsho's case, it wasn't the contract, but like, yeah, you don't think he was looking over at Gabriel Moreno. Well, line I just think he was the, he was the figurehead of yeah. the blue Jays off season and their new. Yeah. Re- he the, he kind of became an holder. avatar of yeah. the front office's approach to the off season in a way that wasn't necessarily fair to him, but that's, you know, like, like you always say, that's what no, the his, his for. best moments of the season were bookends. He started yeah. the season opening game, uh, the opening game, right on the road. He comes up with a massive uh, RBI. And then he ends the season with a bomb that people thought was going to be basically season changing and was going to result in him being the man again in a, in a huge spot for the Jays. It was that ultimately I think ended up in a loss, but either way, um, Dalton Varsho, how, how confident are you that there is going to be a significant positive regression? And, and like, where do you see this thing kind of topping out or where do you see the improvement manifesting itself the most. So I, I think there's, this is probably the guy I'm most confident in being better than last year. Yeah. Um, part of that is floor. Yeah. I mean, part of that is if you are an elite defensive outfield, like he, he was bad at the plate last year and was still yeah. worth about two wins. Sure. Because I, I gotta di- be honest though. I really don't care about that stuff because no, I know. it's like you could get Bradley Zimmer flying around yes. out there. If you're going to have Lucas him is on the way. roster. Yeah, exa- yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, there Didn't is need a to trade Gabriel Moreno for a defensive outfielder. Oh yes. Yeah. So th- this is not to say yeah. that there's, Dalton Varshall would probably yeah. have to win, like win MVP for me to feel yeah. okay with giving away a franchise catcher. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know how I feel about catchers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it hurts a lot, um, especially with like no disrespect to Brian Servin and his new swing path and yeah, stuff sure. like that. But yeah. yeah. Um, 
anyway, so yes, the floor there is significant. But with Varsho, so first of all, his projection, since again, I don't I don't live by these things, but you asked me to bring them. Mm-hmm. Uh, his baseline projection, like 50th percentile outcome, league average hitter. And if you are uh, if you are a plus defender in center field and left mm-hmm. field and a very good base runner, um, uh, league average bat gets you to probably like a four win season if you stay healthy. I was going to say 85 OPS plus last year. Yeah. So 74 OPS. So he's pegged at 99. Yeah. For this coming year, yeah. which is uh, a nice thing. It's, it's in line with his 2021, which was uh, he played two thirds of the season and mm-hmm. and hit at that level. Um, he had his 2022 before they traded for him was fascinating because like, again, I know you don't put as much value in the, you know, how much value you're getting from defense and base running and stuff like that. But he almost he was like almost nobody in the history of baseball has had a five win season with an OBP below 300. Mm-hmm. And he almost did. He had a 302 mm-hmm. OBP and was worth like 4.9 wins. Yeah, um, so this guy can do a lot without checking that OBP box that someone like me usually really values. Now he's had a better spring in terms of plate discipline, what he's laying off and things mm-hmm. like that. Um, but I think look, last year, the thing that was missing most at the plate, like he struck out and walked the same amount as before made roughly the same amount of contact. The power wasn't there. This is a guy who they expected to hit 25, 30 bombs and he hit 20 and it was kind of like an underwhelming 20. I think that side of it comes back. And honestly, like spring training stats don't really mean anything. Mm -hmm. If there's something over the years that has felt like it's meant something at times, the, the base stealing aggression where he led all of spring training and stolen bases. um, He had eight in spring in what in 19 games. Mm. So I'm not saying he's going to be Estuary Ruiz, but if he can steal 25 bases in addition to a couple extra home runs, getting that OBP a little closer to 300, like the floor is high enough that he only needs to be better at a couple little things. And then you talk to some of the swing people, um, who have seen him in spring and think like, yeah, he looks way more comfortable up there. The the holes are minimized and things like that. I'm not going to go as far as, chopping up the the swing film and stuff. But I think you, you improve the plate discipline just a little bit. Some of that power comes back. You increase the base running a little bit like he has in spring. And all of those little improvements, suddenly you're a league average hitter who plays elite defense. Mm-hmm. I think people will be much less mad at the no, I don't know if people are going to stay mad. Maybe some always will because, again, he is a, like I think he said, avatar, right, yeah. for the Shapiro Atkins. And some people are just out on that front office and they're pissed and they want to funnel their Hatred, and so it's like if the Varsho trade continues to not go well, that is like the main thing that you can just point to and say, "Well, these guys are failures because of this," right? And so I get it, and that's fine. I, I don't, I don't, I'm not bothered by fans that way. I will say this about the defense stuff. Um, I feel like every time I take this position of I don't care about the defense, I'm not trying to minimize that I understand the impact that he has defensively or that he's one of the better players. My thought has just always been. I don't want to trade a premium asset, especially when you don't have a lot of them at a premium position who also plays great defense yeah. when the hit tool isn't going to be there or it's not even going to be a plus. Like what I right. want to see from Varsho is actually not a league average hitter. The marker for success for me in this trade, if you were to say win it, which looks harder and harder by the yeah. day. I mean, Arizona's got five years yeah, of Gab Merrill Moreno for left. Sure. Yeah. But from for their standpoint, for me to really believe that they made a good trade, he actually needs to be not only the plus defender, but actually a plus hitter too. Yeah. And this is the thing for me why I, I still believe in the, the bat. 761 OPS on the road last year, 576 at home. Crazy. Like... I, I didn't this look this is a, up. This is a ballpark that look was there supposed were, to play to him. Yeah, there was yeah. some disagreement. Like like Petriello and I ran our little simulations and <laughs> came up to, to different results. Uh, mine was very bare bones yeah. and like playing around on my computer. Petriello's was like, let's use mm. MLB Statcast power. Um, and like they disagreed. Like the Blue yeah. Jays thought it would play neutral. Petriello's numbers said they would play it would play a little positive to hitters. Mine said they'd play a little negative to hitters. But what all those things agreed on was that lefty, like that lefty power alley should have been friendly to guys. And we didn't see that very much, but we yeah. really didn't see it for Dalton Varsho. Okay. So that basically when we do the high end projections of our show, what do they say? Uh around an eight hundred OPS. Yeah. And 27 bombs. Cause I was, so, so that's not the hundred. That's not the tippy that this is 90th percentile. Cause I'll tell you that 90th percentile, you hit that and everybody, even the me's who ripped the trade, they're going to shut up. You, you hit 27 to 30 home runs and you have a OPS that starts with an eight with that defense. 
everybody's going to love you. Yeah, right? I mean, you're going to be a, a four favorite. and a half win player, probably. Especially five win since you're going to have electric plays on the bases. You're, he's a great yeah. base runner, and yeah. if he steals, if he starts stealing bags, that's going to be. He's my favorite kind of base runner, where like yeah. he is absolutely like yeah, he is not awesome. what you would call fast. No, but you, he's just like smart, good angles, yeah. good jump, good timing, and he looks like a football player when he runs, which yeah. is what I really like about. Him. Yeah, is, I, I want to love the Arden Bar show. I want to yeah. be there with. He's them. like Christian McCaffrey trying to steal base. Yeah, that's it. I really like it. Okay, so the other guy, Alejandro Kirk, positive, negative regression. He had a six. 92 um, OPS last year down from 786, which, you know, is especially interesting because I feel like most people would agree that the process was still good. He didn't get on base. The he same never way. swings at bad pitches, yeah. but there's a, you know, part of the discussion last year was like you, even if you have a good eye yeah. and Kevin dealt with this early in the year, if you have a really good eye and you lay off balls, but you can't do damage. Yeah. It's hard to draw a walk when a pitcher's comfortable throwing you a lot of strikes. So mm-hmm. he had, this was the third season in a row. He's played three seasons in the majors where his walk and strikeout rate were basically identical mm-hmm. for his career. They're almost dead even, but walking 10 or 11% of the time and never striking out is not crazy valuable. If a pitcher is comfortable Hey, with three balls, I can groove it down the middle yep. and you're going to hit 140 yeah. on pitches down the middle or whatever. Or it was. if I put you on base, you're going to be one of the worst base runners in all baseball. And Hey, that bat the ball skill. Mm-hmm. That's really, really good. And Luisa rise like hit like what? 360 or whatever last year being a slower guy with bat the ball skill. Mm-hmm. But like most people in the league are not Luisa rise who can just poke a line drive in between the second baseman and the right fielder over and over and over again. For most people, if you're going to be a bat to ball, put the ball in play guy, you have to have the ability to get from home to first. Mm -hmm. And that's not there uh, for him. And that's how like a guy who has probably the best plate discipline and best eye on the team ends up with like a three thirty four OBP, which is solid, but like not like the, the hit tool and plate discipline tool for this guy are that of like a 360, 370 OBP guy. I was going to say that's actually even more of like a, a frustrating thing for me with, with Kirk is that he is so good at like, that was the, if you're talking about the moments of the season where they had uh, what was it like two on two out guys to me, it's like, he was one of the dudes of, how many guys had that exact count? You're talking about the three O worked yeah. himself into a great count. And then it ended up being, you know, a soft fly out. You, yeah. uh, like something. That, oh, well, here's a fastball down the middle. Yeah, See what you can do just, with it. He never did any damage on it. Eight home runs last year. I guess if we're doing the positive regression with Alejandro Kirk, it's, it, it centers around that then is, do you yeah. think that he can add more power with that frame? Can he at least get closer to the 14 home runs that we saw granted in, in more games, more plate appearances in 2022? I do. I think a little bit like I don't, this is a guy who, you know, in 2022, that OPS was close to 800. Mm -hmm. I was 787. His 90th percentile projection has him well into the 800s, like 815, 820. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I see that. I don't know if we've seen the power consistently enough. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know if his approach that is so contact and don't make an out oriented will let him unlock full power over a whole season, Mm -hmm. but I think like getting him back to a 760, 770 OPS type where he's a, that's a very good hitter for the catching position and a pretty solid hitter overall. Like, Mm -hmm. I think, I think he has that the discipline and the hit tool are just like, he's too, he has too good an approach to not be a solid hitter. Mm -hmm. Um, I just, at this point, I like, if he hit 15 home runs, I'd probably be like, like happily surprised. Oh yeah. That that'd be his career high. He had 14 in 2022 when he was an all-star. Yeah. So yeah, okay. I'm taking I'm taking the 15 every single day of the week. Yeah. Like if that happens for you, I actually think that you're back to all-star Alejandro Kirk because if you if you've got that bat to ball and all of a sudden you're putting that many out of the yard, yeah, you're you're an all-star catcher again. Cuz that that was the thing with him is and I'm glad he made strides with his defense because they were actually really significant mm-hmm. and he deserves credit for them, but it's always again, it's harder to give guys a lot of credit for that so- when they're projected or uh, portrayed as significant offensive contributors. And yeah. then during an offensively down season, they're also not producing at the rate that we were first accustomed to. And, you know, when it comes to like your point with Varsho's defense, for example, if he's not mm-hmm. hitting at all, there are other guys who are good defensive outfielders, yeah, right? Like the, the replacement level is only difficult if you're doing all the things like yeah. Cam Eden, who was on the 40 man for a minute last year, mm-hmm. like, 
he is the best defensive outfielder in the system. If all you cared about was the outfield defense, well, you'd have him yeah, up. Put him in. Jeff Mathis would still be in the league if all we cared about yeah. was the catcher's defense. Like yeah. I know Houston won a World Series playing Martin Maldonado every day. Mm-hmm. But that's kind of a joke. And he's um, also clutch. Yeah, he is. Um, so, and here's another thing. And this is me turning my back on the the nerds a little bit, and okay. and yeah. turning nice. in my I'm a I'm a big catcher guy okay. card a little bit. All right. I believe that these catching metrics that we have line up fairly well with the eye test. I believe that mm. when you look at the leaderboards, like, yep, yeah, that makes sense. That guy feels like a good catcher. I've watched that guy 10 times this year. That makes sense. And I know that there is stability in those. Like they're, they're good stats. The way we value like the, the total value that gets assigned to him, I think is a little high. So like Alejandro Kirk last year, his value only on the defensive side was the equivalent of like a top 40 hitters offensive value. So you're telling me that ca- the catcher defense alone, and he only played, he only started like 90 some odd games. The catcher defense alone in 90 some odd games was as valuable as like the second best hitter and their offense in like a good offense. That, that to that me is a little wrong. extreme. Yeah. And like, again, I love catchers and I, I think these are good stats, but I, I I tend to like when we look at Kirk's year last year, it's like, oh, he was almost a two win player despite the hit the hitting. I think maybe we give there's a little bit too much value. I'll in be the more definitive stuff. than that. I don't think maybe as a okay. non math guy, I would like to s- yeah. stay uh, say very s- like sternly that is wrong. This is I don't want to go on a side tangent here. I want to yeah. stick to the segment, but this is the one of the things that actually usually bothers me the most about the analytics community is that when there is such a hard deviation like this. Like when we start to get um, guys who game these systems, right? Like Kirk Cousins is great at it. Where mm-hmm. every single year you look at the QBR stats, right? Or a lot of the analytics and they tell you that Kirk Cousins is one of the better quarterbacks in the NFL. It's like... Just not uh, on prime time. Yeah, but it's like, yeah, we get it. He's, he games the system on completed passes. Right. Find a way to adjust that model instead of year over year telling us that he's one of the best five guys in the NFL when every single... No, there's not one person on planet Earth who would stake their life or reputation on Kirk Cousins in a meaningful football game. So, yeah, I, I don't know why they would continue to push that out there when there's just no way that that can be true anyway. Yeah, um, and look, this, some of this is just like you got to adjust sure. these stats over time and thing like, things yeah. like that. I just, yeah, this is, uh, it's one of my most like anti, and not anti-analytics, but just like where yeah. I have a poor, and like obviously I'm about to start a season where I do two hours a day talking about the Jays yeah, and, sure. and the numbers stuff comes up. But that's why people um, like your show though. And that's why people, I think, again, this is what the analyst community needs a little bit more of is less of a dogmatic approach to certain things and more of a nuanced look at stuff, which is funny because that's sort of what a lot of those people wanted from the eye test community from the outset of uh, this becoming a major advancement. Okay. So my last, can he be a big upside guy? Can there be a real positive regression? Actually, I, I don't even know if this should be like a positive regression because he was so good when he first arrived, but then I think the numbers sort of leveled out mm-hmm. um, is babe Schneider. Uh, like Ennis is, extremely high on him. He looks at the minor league numbers and he says, what if this guy is one of the best second basemen in all of baseball, essentially. And then I hear from people down at spring and they go, well, actually he's the dude that might get shuttled down to triple a first. And I mean, it was possible if Espinal, if that Espinal trade didn't materialize, right? Right. We don't care about spring stats really, but when it comes to a prospect, like he's also, he's not young for a prospect, but if it comes down to say Espinal was still on the roster and the question was, well, do you want David Schneider as a pinch hitter and starting against lefties? Or do you want him getting every day at bats in triple a to continue to get better? He might've lost that argument. Mm-hmm. Okay. So where, yeah, bad are we, spring. where are you at with the ability to, I don't want to say replicate what we saw when he first came up because that was outrageous. That was, was also the like, only fun moment of the entire yeah, season. Yeah, no, it was, it was very much the Lynn sanity of the Jays season yeah. where it was a couple weeks of just extreme fun and people going, can this be sustainable? This can't possibly stay sustainable, but yeah, where are you at just in terms of his ability to provide surplus value? Yeah. I mean, he makes the league minimum, right? So like yeah. the surplus value is pretty if, straightforward. If he's a baseball player. Yeah. yeah. And, and look, I don't, I think, uh, the time in left field is a bit of an adventure. He's okay at second base. There's going to be enough plate appearances for him against lefties as a pinch hitter and things like that. He's going to have a role on this team. Yep. And having that, like if you look at the Jays benches from the last couple of years and you compare it to this year where you have David Schneider and for the time being Vogelbach off the bench, you have actual offensive threats yeah, nice. off the bench is a power. really, is a really nice thing to have, right? Real like, power like, whereas in that, like Santiago Espinal pinch hit a bunch mm-hmm. last year. Mm-hmm. That sucks. 
Uh, and now you're going to have, you know, David Schneider against, against tough lefties, Daniel Vogelbach against tough righties like that. That's anyway, it's an improvement. Uh, his path to being an everyday guy is he would have to be significantly better than mm-hmm. Isaiah Kiner Falefa at the plate because the defensive gap is so big, or he's got to outplay Cavan, which Cavan has the slight benefit of being on the, the stronger side of a platoon, right? Mm-hmm. Like even if those guys went straight platoon, Cavan would get about two thirds of the starts. So that's his challenge there in terms of the skill set, The power is real. Mm-hmm. Um, there's not really much question about that. He's a guy who, again, a lot of the triple a guys coming up um, have had they, the one thing the org has done a really, really good job on is this swing decision stuff uh, of laying off stuff. You can't do damage on. Mm-hmm. And it's why one of the challenges for David Schneider, when he came up and, and there was a book on him was that high fastball yeah. because in triple a, just lay off of it. The the pitchers down there can't pinpoint locate yeah. that as much. The automatic ball strike system was a little bit favorable to short guys at the top of the zone is what the data nice. says. Um, nice short Kings. Yeah. Let's go. Yeah. Like you might, finally, hear the, you might've heard the name Rafael Lantigua during spring training, like a, a bunch Suck of it, Michael. Uh, yeah. <laughs> You're never playing minor league baseball, buddy. Um, yeah. Like Lantigua was even shorter than Schneider. And, and a couple of the triple a yeah. guys joked to me last year. Like this guy's never taken a walk in his whole career. We yeah. get the automatic ball strike system. And, and suddenly Hell he's yeah. uh, he's Joey Barr with the yeah. plate discipline. Finally short guys <laughs> um, in professional sports. Getting an advantage. Yeah. Um, now, in terms of him, like, doing enough to, to beat out Biggio for an everyday spot and, you know, just carve out more playing time, like, he's got to correct some of the holes in the swing. Like, he's not going to be – he doesn't profile right now as, like, a high-contact, high-average guy. There's going to be a lot of swing and miss there, mm-hmm. which is fine if you're belting the bombs. Um, and he does take a good number of walks. Um, but, yeah, I, I think – I like I like the person and the player a lot, but I think for this year, yeah, yeah. don't play you, politics. We know you you've been at pitch talks with him and you've, yeah, you've chummed around. Yeah, in the I just think like yeah. the more reasonable expectation yeah. for this year is like he's a really solid bench plea bench piece slash start. Oh, did you want to say plebe? Like, yeah. He's a bench plebe. plebe. <laughs> uh, no, like like start two games a week and yeah. be a, a really valuable bench piece. There are just there are enough question marks beyond the raw power. Mm-hmm in terms of, you know, how elite pitchers are going to be able to exploit him, you know, high in the zone with elite velocity. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I just, I have some question marks there. So I, yeah. I think he, I think he's like a good bench player, but even like the, the not to live and die by the projection systems, but even those ones, like they don't, they see him being like a little above average at the plate. Mm-hmm. And part of that is just like all of these things. When you only have 35 games of major league sample, they're all going to be like regress, Yep. Like he'll come back down to earth. Well, yeah, he had 35 um, games and he hit 12. What was it? No, sorry. Eight bombs, eight bombs. Yeah. yeah. And like 20 ribbies and like, yeah, mm-hmm. he was, he was unbelievable. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I could see a scenario where his role this year is more like it was at the end of last year, which was, you're going to get one or two starts a week. And it's going to be a little frustrating because you might get that one start in a week, hit a home run and people mm-hmm. will be like, why aren't you in the lineup? Um, you know, also if some of this could be like, we, we didn't, I didn't get to see him a ton at second base during spring. Mm-hmm. Um, if he's improved there, that, that changes the conversation a little bit too. Um, like, I think he's going to start in left field against, against lefties because mm-hmm. you have Varsho and Kiermaier who you're going to want to get days off and mm-hmm. you probably don't want to, you might not want to play both of them against lefties. Um, but yeah, it's basically him, him, Kevin Clemente and IKF competing for the, the second base and third base slots. Yeah. And I, I think he's either going to have to tear the cover off the ball or have shown real growth as a defensive second baseman that no, and nobody talked about that at spring. So I'm assuming it hasn't happened. Mm-hmm. So if I'm going to summarize the upside guys uh, or the guys that I listed as yep. the big potential upside guys, um, it feels like you have Vlad as likely big potential upside. Yeah. Uh, not, not 2021 upside, yeah, yeah. but no, he's no, going no. to be better we, than the last two years. Yeah, we did that. Yeah. But I'm just saying this is, this is the easy yeah. way to mark it down, yeah. right? His, you have Vlad as likely big potential upside, Varsho has likely big potential upside Kirk has upside, but not as big as we would be sort of thinking, especially based on when he first broke in and it looked like this was a generational offensive catcher. Um, And then David Schneider probably more likely to be not yet looking at an upside real impact player on this roster. Right. Okay. So have we hit all the guys that you think I should have outlined as big positive regression or big positive regression guys, or is there someone else that I missed that you think actually has a lot more to give offensively, not from a war standpoint and not defensively, just like offensive actually adds to this group in a more significant way. Other than that, I think like Ernie Clement is like a legitimately helpful 
piece and yeah. more of that value comes on the offensive side. Like I yeah. know there's the defensive versatility, but he can yeah. hit. Yeah, he can um, hit. And that's, you know, that's not regression though. That's just, we haven't seen the guy yet. Yeah. Um, Cause yeah, my only other guy was going to be uh, IKF. Yeah. Yeah. Because this, 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 this stuff <laughs> bothers me is I'm bringing you these numbers. So he had an OPS plus of 78 last season. Chapman's was 108. And I know Chapman, everyone was like, well, his beginning was so good. And so everyone looks at Chapman as who cares that he left. But over the last three seasons, IKF has an OPS plus of 83 compared to Chapman's 108. He's never been league average at the plate. Yeah. Like not even particularly. <laughs> yeah. Like what's his highest OPS plus 90? Uh, yeah. And their, their careers, uh, IKF is 81 compared to 117 for Chapman. It's just yeah. the thing that I think bothers me actually the most about it is that Chapman's a better glove man. Yeah, like Kiner Falefa yeah. is like the best defensive third baseman on the roster now yeah, and like has played into, shortstop yeah. and yeah. and center field and things like like he's a good defender, mm-hmm. but he's not the defender Matt Chapman is and he's not in the same world as a hitter. And I know they like the contact profile mm-hmm. and stuff and I I think they probably see some stuff that they could have they could like fix and get more out of out of his swing, yeah. but I'm uh I don't know when everyone else in IKF's tier of the free agent market got like two to $3 million and uh-huh. you gave them two years, 15 mil. And also like maybe none of your prospects are ready, but they're all kind of like multi-position infield types. I don't know. I'm not going to get there with that deal. Okay. Let's uh, take a quick break and then let's get into the, can they just stay the same or are they going to negatively regress? There's three guys oh, I have wow. next. Okay. So now there's three guys, three vets, three older dudes that, I wanted to go over in terms of potential negative regression. And that is George Springer, Justin Turner. And then lastly, because it, it just feels almost painful to do this, but they actually got a lot from Kevin Kiermeyer last yeah. year. Like he was a 741 OPS guy. So I'm going to start with him. He, he ended up hitting eight bombs. It's like his best offensive season for a long time. Like just to put it in perspective for him, these were his OPS uh, seasons before that 649, 716, 683, 676, 653, right? 741 in his age 33 season. I, I guess the question here is how significant do you think this drop off is going to be? Because it, it looks like it could actually be a lot for a guy that had, yeah, 408 plate appearances for this team last year. Yeah. So Kiermaier and Springer back to back here are interesting because both of them were in their age 33 season last year. Um, one guy went up, one guy went down. And the projection systems have them going in different directions this year. Mm. Um, they have Kiermaier going down and Springer coming back up, which okay. is interesting because usually at when you're into your early to mid 30s, these projection systems, and it's not universal, but basically once you start to decline, Mm -hmm. they throw up a red flag. Yeah. They're like, guys don't often get it back. Maybe it was an injury thing, but like the, the system can only see guy in his thirties started getting worse. Now in Kiermaier's case, I'm not all that surprised that it's not buying that he's suddenly a better hitter in his thirties. I would understand like there was, there was the hip stuff. Mm -hmm. There was the, you know, maybe just the comfort level, whatever. He spoke very highly about his fit and things like that. Um, the average, like the baseline projection for him has him at a 664 OPS. So that's a pretty good drop off from 741 mm-hmm. last year. That would still make him a pretty valuable piece um, because he's, you know, the best defensive center fielder in baseball. Sure. Um, most of his career with Tampa Bay, he was in the kind of 80 to 90 range. Like the last, the last five years before he came to Toronto, four of those years, he was in the 80 to 95 range in terms of OPS plus. Mm-hmm. Um, only one of those years was he an average hitter when he was an average hitter it was early in his career, like his yeah. early to mid twenties. So um, you can be a very good version of Kevin Kiermeyer and not hit particularly well. That's probably where I'd I'd place the bet. When you dig in under the surface and and try to see, you know, why was he better last year? Um, there's not a ton there. He cut the strikeout rate, which is really nice. Um, he did. He said coming into the year, he had told Ben Wagner this that he wanted to lead the league in hits from the nine hole. Um, I think yeah. he ended up doing that, but he started coming up higher yeah. in the in the batting order. Um, but that to me, like even though that was a little jokey. Um, that to me was like, okay, maybe this is a more contact oriented approach. Maybe that suits a guy like that at that age. And we did see it. It, it was the lowest strikeout rate he had since he was 25. Mm. So that part of it's maybe real, but yeah, the overall package suddenly being an above average hitter, I'm going to trust the longer track record here okay. that, that he's going to come down, come back down offensively. still yeah. a very valuable player. Um, I'd also just like between the bat maybe coming down a little bit and age and stuff like that. I yeah. like 129 games was the second most he'd ever played in a season. 
Yeah. I'm going to probably take the slight under on that too. Yeah. I, and I don't think the plan was ever for him to play that many games in the first place. No. And and the plan this year is probably like, listen, if he, if he ends up with that many plate appearances again, 408, mm-hmm. then to me, that's actually indicating that your offense once again was really not in a great place and you were leaning on him too heavily. Um, okay. So George Springer, 102 OPS plus last year. Um, the, the, I think the, more significant stuff that I sort of want to ask you about because yeah, maybe I should have put him in positive regression because that seems so low for a guy who's uh, over his 10 year career has a 128 OPS plus. But he's 34. Yeah, but that's the thing is I'm kind of hoping that it's a, I guess, positive regression in the season, but that you look at some of, and again, I don't understand all of these things uh, nearly as well as you do, but in reading a lot of the metrics with his, Stuff. It wasn't like this guy was unlucky last year. It's that he's showing a lot of signs of decline. So, yeah, early in the season, there was a little bit of he's getting unfortunate. He's having some bad ball luck. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it hit a point where it seemed like he changed his approach. He got more aggressive early in counts. There was a little bit of success with that. Mm-hmm. But what trailed from that was a guy who's always been a very high walk guy wasn't taking as many walks, which can be fine in general, but he's your leadoff hitter, right? Like he, his approach last year was more like a five hitter where he's going to be aggressive early in counts. You're maybe selling out for the power or looking for the power early a little bit more, um, not working as deep into counts. That can be fine. Um, but over the course of the season, what we then saw was he was getting challenged more early in counts. And if you look at the whole season, the mm-hmm. biggest, and this is, it's going to be fascinating to me because the, the progressions, the projection systems are optimistic about him. So he had, he had what last year, 732 mm-hmm. OPS. Mm-hmm. His baseline is like 780 mm-hmm. and his upside outcome is like 815, 820. So they see him bouncing back to like potentially as good as 2022 when he had like a, an 820. When you look under the hood into his struggles last year, and I just laid out the sequencing, but like the whole season picture, the red flag is that he really struggled with the heater. Mm-hmm. And when you're 34, I, and like last year was the healthiest he's ever been in his whole career. Other than I think one year in Houston where he played every single game. Mm -hmm. Um, He didn't have the nagging stuff. He was playing in right field full time. Like none of the normal Springer caveats applied. He really struggled with fastballs. And I don't like, we've seen really elite hitters. Jose Batista went through this at kind of the tail end of his career. He couldn't catch up to elite velocity. He had to start cheating fastballs early, and that took away some of that elite plate discipline, and the strikeout rate came up, the walk rate came down, and you kind of became more of an all-or-nothing home run hitter. Josh Donaldson went through that with the Yankees. Um, when we were, when it was Aaron Judge watch and Donaldson was here for those series, I was very locked in on those mm-hmm. games from good seats, and Josh Donaldson was jumping to get ahead of fastballs very, very early. And it created these big holes in his swings. And he just like, he hasn't been able to put it all together since I'm not saying it's that bad with Springer. He hit not, he wasn't the worst hitter in baseball against fastballs, Mm -hmm. but if there's something keeping me from being too optimistic about certainly the 815, 820 OPS bounce back, I think the, you know, 775 ish is completely reasonable to expect from him, given some of the misfortune last year and things like that. But, uh, the trouble with the fastball, like I'm going to see him, I'm going to need to see him do well against high end velocity early on here before I get like too, too confident that he's got even 2022 level George Springer back. Yeah. And and I will say just in, if you're trying to spin it a little positive here is Bautista in 2017, when he really dropped off, he was 37. Yeah. Josh Donaldson with the Yankees first season, when he started to really drop off was 36. Yeah. So those, both those guys were a little bit older yeah. than Springer is right now. This is, I, I need a fast one here fat. Cause we're going to do two quick rapid fire ones. So one of my big theories with the warriors too, is that they're aging really fast because they've also had a ton of miles on the tires when it comes to the playoffs, yes. right? Like they've you added keep a season. Playing. Yeah. Is there something to that with baseball players too, though? Like Springer played a lot of playoff games with the Astros. He's got those extra miles on the tires. Is there anything to indicate that? Because baseball, you would kind of think, no, the more you play, the better you are. You know, like you're just getting more reps. Yeah. Not think, wearing down as much. I think in baseball, because you can move guys to lesser like, positions. Is he an older 34? You, you can slow it. Yes, he is an older 34. And yeah. that's in part because of the playoff runs and in part because he played center field, which is yeah. a premium position yeah, for that. so long. But in baseball, you have the option like Steph Curry can't get off the ball yeah, yeah. or play yeah. 25 minutes. You're just not going to do that. In baseball, you can at least move a guy to a lesser position. Um, and that's part of the the concern with Kiermaier too, right? Is like, he doesn't have 
the miles from games played and deep playoff runs and stuff, but he's, he has a lot of injury red tape. Um, so you wonder, you know, is that an old 33? Is it an mm. old 34? Springer's probably on that end, but the ability to move him to, off of center to right field probably slows that a little bit. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, you know who's an old, uh, I would say, 39? <laughs> the, the oldest player on an active is roster Justin today? Justin Turner. Yeah. Again, let's, we'll try to keep this one shorter, but yeah, you look at the... OPS last year was a slight uptick from the season before in his age 30, 38 season, but it was also playing at Fenway um, and his OPS plus actually still did drop. Um, yeah. What do you, what do you think Justin Turner provides you? Is he going to be able to just maintain that level of an 800 OPS 114 OPS plus? Yeah. Um, I mean, the baseline projection would say no, it has yeah. a more at like 750, 760, but mm. that is also like those, those systems are not going to trust anyone who's 39 years old. Mm-hmm. Uh, he still has a good high percentile outcome where, you know, that's we're talking like an 820 in the mm. 90th percentile outcome, which the Jays would absolutely take Kill on for. this year that he signed. Um, I think they're going to not play him every day the way Boston needed to. Like, I like he's going to be in there a lot, but 146 games is mm-hmm. probably not the plan for a 39 year old. I think if he could run back next year, you're really happy with that. Um, maybe not even the 23 homers, but but the ability like he has a good on base ability as well. Um I think my guess here would be he's really solid. Maybe I think he could repeat last year. 115 OPS plus. I think he has enough Mm -hmm. just raw offensive talent to repeat that. I don't know if he sticks in the heart of the order where they have him the the whole season and what that looks like if he only plays like 130 games maybe. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think he could run back next year. There's enough raw power there and he has such a good approach that Mm -hmm. I can see 115 OPS plus again. I hope so because I just... I really do think that if you're talking about fan favorite potential, it's that he's the highest upside. This fan base having to come around on a guy who guy. played on the 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 evil Dodgers empire and the Red Sox. No, but is, you know how uh, great it would be is if he the Dodgers gave up on what should have been a Dodger great, and he ends up closing his career with the Jays. He's great, and then Shohei yeah. embroiled in his controversy falls apart. Yeah. Like, yeah. If this fan base can come around on Kevin Kiermaier, the yeah. stealer yeah, of Blue yeah, Jays that's, home that's runs I mean, for a yes. decade, you can come around on but, one year. Uh, you can wash off one year of Red Sox yeah. stink. I think that there's only uh, one guy that they couldn't have turned around on in the last decade. And he happens to be the guy that punched Jose Bautista in the face. And that's it. Uh, uh, right. Who also uh, l- walked away from yeah. his Korean team the other day because they tried to send him to the minors. Mm. In Korea, he was getting sent to the minors and he just he bailed on his team. Yeah, that's a tough look. That's a tough look. That's a tough way to close a career. Uh, Blake yeah. Murphy, you're on again in an hour. Thanks so much for making time. See you, buddy.